Thank you for that uh, very nice introduction. It, it shows that if you live long enough, you have a lot of activities that you may wish to forget. <laughs> In any event, I'd like to thank uh, the Sacker Foundation, uh, David, uh, Mira Marcus, who's been, uh, Mira Marcus Kale, has been splendid in shepherding us around. And uh, she ordered this lovely weather. Uh, I don't think we have weather like this in the United States. So, uh, and also the opportunity, I have many friends here and it's just a pleasure to see them all and uh, chat with them and find out what they're doing and what they're doing, what, what's going on. And you have a wonderful group of statistical scientists in Israel. You should be very proud of them. Uh, I uh, met with the president of the uh, university and he presented me with a uh, book he had written on something called Random Walks. Obviously, he knows much more mathematics than I ever knew. <laughs> so that's the first time I've seen such an impressive mathematician as president of a large university. He should be very, very proud of him. The uh, topic I'm going to discuss is, uh, deals with multicenter clinical trials. Essentially, when one is carrying out medical studies, for particular diseases, uh, single institutions don't have enough patients, so institutions get together and cooperate and enter patients into a common study, and these are what we call multicenter studies. And uh, many of them are going on all over the world. And uh, I have some issues with most of the people on how one goes about analyzing these studies. Uh, the work I'm going to talk about is uh, joint with uh, my uh, former student, uh, Summer Zhang, and this is uh, w one of her <laughs> assistants. <laughs> uh, this is an outline of my talk. I'm going to discuss the basic philosophy and practice talk about what I refer to as global and local inference. And then when you talk about best treatment for disease, what do you mean by best treatment? And then I'm going to go into some background of some elementary statistical areas about conditioning and how one designs studies. I'm going to discuss randomization. And then I'm going to bring this background together on multi-center trials and then show uh, what the advantages are uh, if you take my point of view into account. The uh, basic philosophy about the practice of trials is that when you analyze a study, the analysis should be guided by the design of the study and account for significant factors affecting outcomes. So that uh, most of us would agree that if you're going to analyze a study, it should be guided by the design. And of course, one has to make a distinction in what kind of inference do you want to make? Do you want to make, you want to open up your mouth wide and yell to everybody in the world what you found, or do you want to whisper because you're not sure of what's going on? However, in practice, the design of studies are mainly ignored. Most analyses uh, neglect center to center variation. If you're talking about drug trials uh, where there are potential side effects, depending on how the institution deals with side effects, uh, the uh, doses of the drugs may be very different. And it accounts for lots of variation. M many des many uh, studies are designed uh, by what we call permuted blocks, and I'll discuss that later, but that's also ignored. And uh, when, I, when I said that there's a lot of variation uh, between hospitals, uh, although we know, know that that's a fact, in many clinical trials you have 
many hospitals that just enter a handful of patients and because of the natural history of the disease, uh, uh, there are many factors influencing outcome. It's hard to discern the variation between hospitals because of the many factors associated with the natural history of the disease. So this is often ignored. Now, I make a distinction between what I call local inference and global inference. A local inference is where the conclusions of the study only apply to the patients who entered the study. That is, if you're comparing two treatments, what's the best treatment for the patients who entered the study? Not what the best treatment for this disease is. That's a local inference. A global inference is where the conclusions of a trial might apply to the population with disease. This is the, the kind of uh, inference we all like to make. So under what circumstances do these differ? Now here's the idealized clinical trial process for a randomized trial. We start off with the population with disease, and then we might take a random sample of patients from this population, and then these patients might enter a clinical trial, and if we're comparing two treatments called A and B, we use a chance allocation mechanism to assign patients to A and to patients for B. Now, if one wants to make an inference about the treatment for the population with disease, you need a sample of people from that disease. And we like to have a random sample. On the other hand, in nearly all clinical trials, it's impossible to get a random sample of patients to enter a study. Whoever happens to be around uh, in the hospital with that disease might be approached to enter uh, a, a study. So there's no random sample at all. So what you have is patients who happen to be there, they agree to enter a study, and then, strictly speaking, the only inference you can make from the study is what's the best treatment for the patients who entered the disease. Very different from what's the best treatment for the disease. Now, when we talk about best treatment, how do you define it? Well, one way of defining it is you have uh, the best treatment as the one where you have the most favorable outcome to a randomly chosen patient being treated in a randomly chosen hospital. Of course, the variation between patient uh, outcomes for treatment, and depending on the hospital, there may be variations among hospitals. So on the average, you want to find over a random uh, hospital treating a random patient, what's the best treatment? So that if you're going to have uncertainty in specifying what's the best treatment, the uncertainty comes from two sources. One is the variation between patients, and the other is the variation between hospitals. So in analyzing a trial, one can think of four models. Now, when we take, when we know about a random sample, that's we have a population and we randomly draw individuals or hospitals from that population, and that's what I call a random sample. What I call a collection is a group which is not a random sample. That is, when you're entering patients in a study that just happened to be around being treated for that in that hospital, that's a collection. Uh, we don't know any much about them. Uh, they're certainly not a random sample of patients. So you can have a patient population, which is a collection or a random sample, and you can have an institute or hospital population, which is either a collection or a random sample. 
And there are four possibilities. I've numbered them one to four. If you're in situation one, where both the patient and institute populations are collection, the conclusions of the study only apply to the patients and hospitals who are in that study. What's the best treatment for those patients? If you were in situation four, where you have a random sample of patients and a random sample of hospitals, the conclusions here would refer to the best treatment for the disease. So this would be a global inference, and this would be an, a local inference. And if you have a random sample of, uh, of patients from a hospital and a collection of hospitals, then uh, the inference would be uh, conditional on each hospital, what's the best treatment. Uh, number three uh, has no interpretation uh, that I know of. So there are four possible models. Uh, the collection, collection, you don't open your mouth up very much. Uh, for the random sample, random sample, you tell the world you have the, a very good treatment for the disease. Now, as I indicated earlier, nearly all clinical trials do not have a random sample of patients. So that, strictly speaking, only a local inference can be made unless you make additional assumptions. However, if you're going to make an inference about the uh, local properties, you can rely on the randomization process. That is, the randomization process is injecting uncertainty into the study by allocating patients to the treatments at random, tossing a coin. And what I'm going to show you, uh, for those of you who uh, are very knowledgeable in statistics, in most situations, by relying on making a local inference, you can increase the, st the st statistical power. So you have different characteristics uh, of your uh, inference depending on what kind of inference you're going to make. Now, I have to deviate a bit from my main story by giving you some background for those who may not be uh, very statistical literate. Let's consider two methods of randomization, and we're going to have two trends. Method one. Place two balls in an urn, one labeled A and one labeled B. So when a patient comes in, you reach into the ball, draw a ball out at random. If it's A, you give that to the patient, and then you replace the ball. Or if it's B, you give that to the patient and replace it. Method two is to place say N balls in an urn labeled A, and N balls in the same urn labeled B. And when a patient comes in, you take the ball out, let's suppose it's an A, that's what the, the patient receives for therapy. You don't replace it, you put it aside. So if you continue using method two, eventually you'll exhaust all the balls and you'll have N allocations to therapy A and N allocations to therapy B, equal size. On the other hand, if you have method one, the number of patients assigned to A and the number of patients assigned to B will be a random variable. You can't predict in advance how many will go Thank you. You can't predict how many patients will eventually be assigned to A and how many patients will essentially be assigned to B. So the main difference between these two methods of allocation is that in method two, exactly half of the patients will get A and half the patients will get B. In method one, 
Perhaps approximately half will get A and half will get B, but they will actually differ. Now here I have to slip into a little notation for those uh, statisticians who uh, want to follow the theory a bit. The allocation is uh, really a random process. So delta is a random variable where uh, the subscript i refers to the ith patient, and it's one if the ith patient is assigned to A and zero otherwise. And if you have capital N patients, you have N such deltas. And let's suppose Y is the outcome for a patient where the I refers to the ith patient. So if you were to look at the sum of the outcomes for treatment A, it's just the inner product of delta and Y. And delta is only one when you reach, when it's assigned to A and zero otherwise. So this is just counting the sum of all the observations from uh, treatment A. And you can do a similar thing with treatment B, but one minus delta is the, is one if there's an allocation to treatment B. So this is the sum of the outcomes for treatment B. And if you add the sum of A and the sum of B together, it just is the sum of the Ys. This is a fixed number, because delta is the only thing that's random. And the number of patients assigned to A is just the sum of the deltas. It's only one of this assignment for A. So this is a random quantity also. And if you take the sum of one minus delta, that's the number assigned to B, that's also a random quantity. But if we add these two up, it's just the total number of patients in the study. That's a fixed number. Now, let's compare the two methods of randomization. Delta is the only thing we can't predict. That's the random quantity. In method one, where we just have two balls in an urn and we sample with replacement, the deltas are independent. That is, drawing a ball out a, a, a ball out one time and putting it back in doesn't affect the next time you draw the ball out. So those are independent random variables. Whereas for method two, where you have equal numbers of balls in the urn of A and B, if you draw one out, you have less chance of drawing the same ball out because you've reduced it by one. So that's dependent. But the probability that delta is equal to one, which is the probability of making an assignment to treatment A, is one half for both of them. And the variance is one fourth for both of them. However, the covariance for independent deltas is zero, but there's a negative correlation for dependent variables. And if you look at the expected uh, values of the sum of the A's, it's just the, the number of patients expected for uh, A is, if, is capital N over two, and Y bar is just the average. And you get the same result for dependent. On the other hand, if you're going to look at the variability of the sum of the A's, they're very different. One is for independent, one-fourth over the uh, times the sum of the y squares. And here we have a more complicated quantity. However, generally, this quantity is always less than this quantity. So that when you have the fixed number of observations on allocation to A and allocation to B, the variance of uh, the sum of the number of observations is always less than if you had, didn't have a fixed number but a random variable. One thing to keep in mind. So if you're comparing, uh, if you're analyzing a study, and let's suppose you're analyzing the study looking at the sample averages. That is the sum of the observations over, of A over the number of people there and a similar thing for B, and we make a comparison. And, but we know that the sum of 
observation for A and the sum of observations from B doesn't involve the delta at all. Delta is the only unknown quantity to random variable. So we can, instead of comparing two averages, equivalently we can just look at the at one uh, sum, say the sum of the observations for A, and compare it with its expected value. Now, because the variance is smaller when the sample size is, is assumed to be a constant, we may have an experiment where the sample size is a random variable. That is, it varies, to, and that's method one in drawing my sample. So in doing the analysis, let's condition it so that we can con condition the analysis so even though the sample size is random, can't be predicted in advance, let's pretend it's fixed. And whatever probability considerations we have to use, take into account probability that we have a fixed sample size because that gives us smaller variability in making the comparison. That's one thing. So regardless of how the study was designed, even though you couldn't predict how many patients are assigned to each treatment, pretend that it's fixed, a constant, and take into account that feature in whatever method of analysis you use. Now, most new studies are designed using something called permuted blocks. And essentially, the treatment allocation is done, say, in blocks of size n. That is, uh, if you have a block of size 4, uh, you have the first four treatments are allocated in some way, and then you go to another block of size 4, and there's allocation, and so forth. Suppose we have two treatments, A and B as before, and suppose the block size is 4. And suppose we wanted to allocate treatments so that in every block, half of the patients go to A and half go to B. So if the block size is 4, we're going to have two patients on A and two patients on B. And in a typical trial, it might look like this. Here's a block of size 4. The first two might get A, the second two might get B. The next set, B, A, B, A. The next set, B, A, A, B, etc. You can't predict what the order within a block would be, except every, in this example, there are two allocations to A and two allocations to B. In terms of the deltas, there are four deltas involved because we're going to allocate four uh, treatments to four patients, the sum of the deltas for each block have to add up to two because delta is only one when it's assigned to treatment A and zero assigned to treatment B. And if every block has two A's, these are going to sum up to two. Now, the use of permuted blocks takes account of changes in the patient population over time. Generally, patients enter one or two at a time, and the patient accrual might go on for uh, several years. And during that time, as people become more familiar with the therapies, they might uh, better understand how to make the therapies more beneficial. So the probability of success might change over time. And to make sure that that doesn't uh, uh, upset or, or bias your analysis, you have this period of blocks where over time uh, every patient uh, 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 is essentially assigned about the same period of time as every other patient. But if you make the assignment that way, then it doesn't say anything about the assignment within a center. If this is a multi-center <coughs> study, you might have 10, 20, maybe 50, 100 hospitals entering uh, the patients in a study, but you're allocating the patients as they come in, regardless of what institution, so that 
you're kind of balancing out any time effects that go on. And this might be even important if the study consists of drugs where there are side effects. And as you get more familiar with the how to uh, administer the drug, you can uh, ameliorate the side effect problem as time goes on. So that the number of allocations in any one institution is a random variable. Can't predict it. And in statistical parlance, these are what we call ancillary statistics. So now suppose one wanted to do an analysis based on randomization. And suppose you have uh, blocks of size n. Well, for the jth block, you just look at the sum of the observations from treatment A. And then if you have many blocks, you just sum all the observations on treatment A and call that SA. But we want to make the distribution, probability distribution, of the sum of the observations for A only based on the randomization process and it should be conditional on the fact that you had permuted blocks, the sum of those deltas uh, adds up to perhaps half the number of observations, and the ancillary statistic, that is the number of patients in the institution is a random variable, but we're going to make it fixed, and we have to take that into account in our probability distribution. So that if you have a uh, multi-center study, you have many centers, and each center, depending on the number of patients they entered on the study, would have different numbers of patients uh, allocated to treatment A. So what you can do is get the joint distribution of the sum of the observations for A, and also the including the distribution is the random variable, the number of observations going to treatment A. And uh, this could be a pretty complicated uh, mathematical problem, but for large numbers of observations, you can show this is approximately what we call a multivariate normal distribution, something we know about. And, if, and then we have to condition on the number of observations going to A. And this is a vector where the number of elements in the vector are the number of centers. So then we have the distribution of the, of, uh, the sum of observations for A conditional on the number of, observa uh, number of observations uh, in each center. And we also have to take into account the fact that we have permuted blocks that some of those deltas add up to n over 2. So that is the way we can do the analysis. We take account of the design of the study, permuted blocks, where the, if you have permuted blocks of size uh, four in each block, two allocations to treatment A. So the sum of the four deltas is two all the time. So that's a restriction on the deltas. You, Although the uh, sample sizes in each uh, institution are random, we're going to make it conditional. And now we're going to apply it to various situations. Now, the <coughs> outcome variables that we're interested in are the observations, Ys could be continuous observations, like systolic blood pressure, or binomial, like a success or failure of an observation, or survival, how long people lived and we're going to have a multi-center trial. And as I said, we're going to condition on the number of patients randomized within a center to the treatments. And then I'm also going to take account of the fact that sometimes uh, studies are designed to be able to stop early and when, when you see something uh, important going on and that's called a sequential trial. And we're also going to have, in this situation, uh, variation between centers. 
So here's a comparison for, say, uh, continuous observations here. One set of, of uh, comparisons deals with 120 patients in a study, another three times that number. And let's suppose it's a multi-center study. The smallest number of centers would be 10. Might go up to 40 here, or here it might go up to 100. So if there's 40 centers, 40 into 120, on the average you get about three patients per uh, institution. If you do what I call the conditional test, which I just described, you have, in this particular situation, it's just a simulation, a power of, for 10 uh, institutions, uh, 0.55, but then as the institutions increase, the power goes down. Now, another way of analyzing this is what we would call a stratified T, and the power is about constant, but you notice that the power here, by conditioning, is much larger than the power here. Now, if we were to switch over to this side, where many more patients, we observe the same phenomenon. You get a comparison between a conditional test, which I just described, <coughs> with what would be a, uh, the ordinary comparison, much higher power, but as the number of institutions go up, the power goes down because it's quite possible that in some institutions, maybe they enter only two or three patients, they all may go to the same treatment. And that t tells you nothing about a comparison. Now, another comparison is when the outcomes are binary, success or failure. And one can use the so-called conditional test or what's commonly used is the, what's called the Mantell-Hensel test. It's essentially uh, uh, many two-by-two two tables. And we observe the same phenomena. As the number of institutions goes up, power goes down, but the power is always larger than what the conventional test is doing. And a similar thing when you have more observations. If you were to do the same thing for survival outcomes, there are two uh, statistical procedures in widespread use, uh, one called the Gein test and the other called the log rank. And we observe the same phenomena. The conditional test always gives you more power, whereas the uh, usual test uh, much less power and as the number of institutions in a multicenter increases, the power goes down. Now, as I mentioned, in the group sequential test, where you have the possibility of ending the trial early, same phenomena. Uh, higher power for the conditional test, uh, less power for the unconditional, but as the number of institutions increase, it goes down. So this is the situation for a conditional, binary, success or failure, or survival. So in general, it appears as if, if you wanted to make a local inference just based on randomization, and you condition on the design of the study, the fact that it's permuted blocks, and you condition on the sample size in each institution, you're likely to get more power than if you ignore it. So, in conclusion, nearly all clinical trials do not have a random sample. And in order to use standard statistical techniques, one always assumes a random sample because you're trying to make an inference about a population with disease. But you have no population, just as a collection of patients. So realistically, only a local inference can be made unless you make some other assumptions. And when you condition on the ancillary statistics, that's the number of patients in each institution, it tends to eliminate center variability without modeling it. We're not modeling it, uh, like in a regression analysis, and it results in greater power. So uh, that brings me to the end of my talk, and uh, thank you for coming.